Prophetic is always about coming into crisis and calamity with solutions. We look at Daniel. Daniel did that. We look at Joseph. Joseph did that. And that's why that they were necessary for the time they were at. I think that it takes a, a great strength to be able to be aware of certain challenges, aware of certain crises, to even maybe be used by God to highlight them to people, but not to lose heart in what God has already said or God is saying. We have to know in the middle of that, there's still something God wants to do. You know, it really doesn't matter if if there was another world war, there would still be something in the middle of that that God is speaking and God is saying. Spiritual warfare is everywhere and we need to be equipped and with us today is Apostle Ryan Lestrange, and he is going to be sharing beyond the article of the article, Overcoming Demonic Dominions and Territories. He's going to share some personal stories of how God has trained him and equipped him and how he's able to see these different strongholds and how we can deal with those. So, Ryan, welcome to Beyond the Article. Thank you. I, look, I'm excited about this conversation. I think that as I wrote in the article, and I'm sure we'll talk about it today, a lot of people are experiencing warfare in their lives, in, in their region, if they're going to a church in their church, but they don't always realize, hey, the warfare I'm experiencing is bigger than just me. And so yeah. I love sort of peeling the layer back so people can realize they're not crazy. Uh, it's not always their issue. Sometimes it's just you're combating what's happening in the territory you're in. And that's so true. You know, I... Um you know, we didn't get a chance to talk about this beforehand, but I was a missionary with Youth of the Mission for eight years into 15 different countries. And if when you fly from one place to another, you if you're if you're attentive to the Holy Spirit, you start to feel different types of oppression. And if you're sensitive to the Holy Spirit, He's going to give you wisdom on what those things are. But they are very territorial. Mm -hmm. And the Bible talks about in Daniel that he was praying and fasting, and the angel had to go and deal with the power, the prince and the power of the air in Persia. And so we know about these demonic territories and dominions. Um, tell us more about your experience with these regional issues. Sure. Um, well, I want to go into an area with this that I don't think I referenced in the article, because I think I referenced one of the first churches that I ever planted. We had a huge amount of warfare with the religious spirit, and we had mm -hmm. to walk through what that was. It sounds so basic now, but at the time I didn't know that's what it was. Um, but I want to talk about my experiences like yours traveling to other nations. I remember I went to a nation in Central America and I was out preaching uh, all day. You know, when you're on a short term trip is go, 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 go. So right. we were busy, 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 got into my room, was staying in a room by myself and just quickly, you know, brushed my teeth, did the nightly routine, jumped in bed, turned the lights out, was ready to go to sleep. And immediately I felt a chill go through my spine. I felt the atmosphere of the room change. And I mm -hmm. realized there's something else in this room besides just me. And I knew it to be demonic. Uh, I began to pray. Now, this is hard to explain to people if it's not happened to you, but I saw this entity. However, I wasn't seeing it with my natural eyes. So it wasn't like an open vision. It was internally I saw it. And this part of the world I was in, uh, there was the history of it. There was a confluence of cultures. One of the cultures there was the Mayan culture. So when I saw this spirit, it appeared in form as a Mayan, uh, hmm. a Mayan lady is kind of what it looked like to me. And the spirit began to actually speak to me. And the spirit began to say, if you don't leave here, I'm going to kill you and I'm going to kill your entire team. Now, I started doing all the spiritual warfare stuff that I knew to do, bind it, command it to go, et cetera, et cetera. And to be honest, it was a while, I don't know, 30 minutes, 45 minutes of that back and forth, the spirit talking to me, I'm commanding it to go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. It finally leaves. Now, when you're dealing with something like that, and this thing has spoken to you, it's like Jezebel sending the message to Elijah. There, there's a level of fear and intimidation behind oh, yeah. the spirit that tries to come on you. So I had to begin to combat that. But I, I knew that whatever encounter I had just had was not just a low level devil. So the next morning I was sharing this with one of my senior team members. I didn't want to share it with people who were new to this stuff because I didn't want to freak them out. And he started talking to some of the locals and they came to me and said, look, there's two spirits that frequently appear to people in this area. And what you've described 
is one of them. Hmm. And I really recognize we were there on an apostolic journey, meaning we've been sent there by the Lord to establish a ministry there to see transformation of the territory. So this was kind of an act 16 situation where Paul steps into a territory and the spirit of divination is manifesting through this young lady, same scenario. And it really, it taught me a lot because I recognize sometimes when we go into a region or territory with an assignment, or we're a part of a team, or a ministry that's in a territory with an assignment, we're going to have counterattacks from that spirit that rules the area. And over the next decade of ministry there, we sort of worked through how do we combat this? How do we partner with those in the region to to, uh, bring them up above the warfare, to teach them, to train them, to combat it in prayer? But it was a very vivid experience. And I had a similar one in the United States as well, one time, uh, a particular region where there was a spirit that appeared and, and did a very similar strategy, but this spirit had a completely different appearance hmm. that I later found out was quite tied into the history of the region I was in. So those are some of the encounters that I've had that opened my eyes to say, okay, we got to really hone in on strategy when we're dealing with this. Yeah, those strategies are, are really important. And hmm. we need to be, we need to study to show ourselves approved and we need to understand what we're dealing with. So how is it that you are able to look at these situations and figure out the strategy? And I guess that that is part of the apostolic anointing on your life. But how does somebody that's a, a lay person or somebody that's just watching this say, I don't understand how to do what the strategies are uh, on how to deal with these things. What's, what's the first step that somebody can take to help them understand the first step that they need to take? I think I go all the way back to what is God saying about a place or a people? And, and, you know, we live in a very complex world. If we're on any given continent, the people that are occupying that continent may not have been the people occupying that continent 500 years ago. I realize that. So um, some of these things are evolving, but I like to use the Genesis principle when the spirit of God is hovering upon the face of the deep, the world is in crisis and God starts to speak from the midst of his presence. And he starts to speak order to chaos. So Mm -hmm. God has already spoken something over any territory we're in, or even a sphere for dealing with the sphere of media. God has already said something about it. So the key is in prayer to start there. Lord, I know you have a plan for this people. I know you have a plan for this place. I Maybe I recently moved and I'm in a region I feel is completely dry and where I was before, there was so many prophetic people and now there's no prophetic people or whatever it is. Uh, but God, what are you saying and what have you already said over this region? For me, I kind of start there. Now, let me say this. I may not always know the answer to that. And I know there's a whole Uh, We could give a whole teaching on sort of spiritual mapping and looking at all the past moves of God in the region and and the challenges. And that's all good stuff. But sometimes you don't have the time in that moment to Mm -hmm. do that in the question you asked. So it starts with the understanding God has said something about this region and the negative I'm experiencing is a counter attack to derail people from having faith to partner with what heaven said. And I kind of start right there. And I think if you as a lay person can start right there, you know, we're, there's so many challenges going on in America right now, things we've never seen, never experienced, whether it be, uh, you know, we've got lab created meat that is coming down the pike that we're freaking out about. We've got economic inflation that some people can't imagine how they're going to purchase a home. You know, we've got weather things going on. We've got political upheavals, but we also know in the middle of all that, God has said something about his people in 2023 and 2024. And we've got to start with that foundation and then work up from that. So I like what you said about how the, the demonic oppression or the demonic strategy over region is to counteract the word of faith that God has spoken for this so that people don't believe what God says. Right. Let's talk about the the whole concept of faith and belief uh, for this for this region. I mean, whatever region it is, I mean, what you're talking about really makes me realize that as you watch the news, as you uh, listen to the radio, as you scroll through social media, um, there's so much doom and gloom out there that it takes us away from what has God said. 
mm-hmm. and it's easy to look at our world today and say the world's going to hell in a handbasket. So how do we then hold on to the faith that of, of what God has actually said, especially whenever we have things where it doesn't look like what God has said in the past has come to pass? Yeah, well, for me, I I have made a decision and I've decided that being a prophetically activated and minded person, I am going to choose that I believe when I look at the prophetic, it is a solutionist anointing, for lack mm-hmm. of better terms. It is the when the mind of God, the brilliance of God, the heart of God comes into a situation, somewhere in the midst of the crisis, there's a solution. Now, you know, that doesn't always mean the crisis is not going to be present with us. And we can look at this historically. We look at the words of Jesus. He said, in this world, this present age, you're going to have tribulation. Mm-hmm. And, and if we look at prophetic timelines and views of the world, uh, we may look at that and say, oh, I believe in, in my understanding, the Bible is going to keep spinning darker and darker and darker. But even in the midst of that, if we want to look at it that way, God's light is going to shine brighter. So I think it's finding that solace, that Psalms 91 place to say the prophetic is always about coming into crisis and calamity with solutions. We look at Daniel. Daniel did that. We look at Joseph. Joseph did that. And that's why that they were necessary for the time they were at. I think that it takes a a great strength to be able to be aware of certain challenges, aware of certain crises, to even maybe be used by God to highlight them to people, but not to lose heart in what God has already said or God is saying. We have to know in the middle of that, there's still something God wants to do. You know, it really doesn't matter if if there was another world war. There would still be something in the middle of that that God is speaking and God is saying. And again, we can look at history and see that. We can look at the time of famine and Elijah gets a prophetic word, go by the brook. And in many ways, it's a type and shadow of the preservation of God for his Mm -hmm. people that we can go there. So I think we kind of have to start at that understanding. I don't approach the prophetic as it's just a barrage or a series of negative reports. I, it's not ignorance. And I do think that we sometimes have to find the rhythm between being aware of what's going on and uh, partnering with God above what's going on. But I think it's very important to have that mindset. It disturbs me when we as prophetic people only put out crisis into the world, but mm. we don't have any sort of sobriety about solutions and strategies. And that's mm. where... I think that fear will kind of cause you just to sink down and you won't have any strategy because you can't imagine a dream of what God could possibly do. Wow. Yeah. We, if you can't imagine a dream of what God will possibly do, that is a, a that is a difficult place to be. Mm-hmm. And um, you mentioned earlier about Elijah and he was in a dark place like that because he had Jezebel uh, saying that I'm going to kill you. You, you killed all my prophets. I'm going to, I'm going to kill you. In, in this article, you talk about the Jezebel spirit as well as the religious spirit as, as two of the main ones that we as in the body of Christ end up dealing with. Mm-hmm. Um, let's unpack what is exactly a Jezebel spirit. So many people just throw that term out there. Right. And I think it's just they use it for anybody, any any woman especially that is um, that are manipulating. Uh, and so – but what is the Jezebel spirit and how do we uh, counteract that today? It's an enchanting spirit. It's rooted in the camp of witchcraft. It's a seducing spirit. It's a dominating spirit. Now, it's a broad-based term. Let me just say this, that I believe when we're dealing with that subject, we're dealing with a class of demons. So what do I mean? I don't mean there's one spirit alone. That's the only, this one demon is the only Jezebel spirit. You know, we can see in the Old Testament Uh, We can see the person Jezebel. We can see in scripture the queen of heaven, which I believe to be a manifestation of the Jezebel spirit. We can then see the Jezebel spirit mentioned in the book of Revelations. So I believe it's a type, a a principality level type of spirit, Mm -hmm. and it operates primarily through seduction, control, and witchcraft. Now, when we deal with witchcraft, there are two sort of arms of this we could break it down. There's the arm of the flesh witchcraft, which would say, you know, I want John to uh, do whatever for me. I want John to feature me in charisma. And so I'm going to do everything I can to influence his decision to do that, bypassing 
what God is saying or God is speaking and me exerting my own human will to manipulate and control. And there is a type of witchcraft rooted in rebellion, which says I won't submit to the will of God. I won't honor godly authority. I want what I want and I want it now that operates through a very fleshly type of witchcraft. This is not doing seances and incantations and spells. Then there's a type of witchcraft, which indeed incorporates that supernatural arm of witchcraft and the Jezebel spirit sort of covers both of those areas. Mm -hmm. And when we see this spirit operational in church settings in Christianity, it's definitely not uh, female based, uh, gender based. We kind of get that from the character Jezebel in the Bible, but we know that spirits can impact and influence men and women. I don't believe it only if we're dealing with a local congregation. It's not only something that will affect a congregant, it can definitely affect a leader. There can be leaders who are Jezebelic. Uh, classic Jezebel is usurping authority. In other words, I don't really have the authority at this level, but I want it. So I'm going to begin to try to penetrate the power structure there. That can happen through seduction. That can happen through uh, false and ulterior motives. I've seen it happen a lot in prophetic circles with people who actually have some level of accuracy, but they're not really consecrated. In other words, mm. they're not getting it from Jesus Christ. They're getting it from familiar spirits, uh, a, a prophetic gift that's maybe not been brought under the blood of Jesus and refined. And so they're prophesying, but they have an ulterior motive. And we can see in the Old Testament, Jezebel had false prophets at her table. So that the reason I sort of reference that particular spirit, always when you have prophetic people and you have prophetic moves and activities that's one of the spirits that's always going to entangle itself there and mm -hmm. the, the goal is to bring an impurity in the prophetic and sort of break down godly authority wow wow <laughs> there's there's so much there and as you were talking about this you know jezebel had these these false prophets with her mm -hmm. um what is the benefit of having a known false prophet on your side well, you know, I think that a known false prophet can potentially endorse your agenda through impure displays of power. And honestly, if I'm speaking transparently, I believe we're really seeing that unfold in our day. I, I want to just say this. I'm 100% pro prophetic fivefold ministry, charismatic Christianity. That's the arm of Christianity that really has changed my life. And I've given most of my adult life to trying to nurture and foster that. But when people can give you detailed information about your life, when they can identify where you're at emotionally or a season you're going through, especially if you're in a vulnerable place, that can really speak to your heart. So the reason why Jezebel likes having those type of associates, it, they, that gifting can gather together people through what I would just call impure prophetic activities mm -hmm. and sort of bring them into the camp and say, hey, did this over here is all right. Another thing I think about false prophets particularly that is challenging and disturbing is that a lot of times it's not just what they prophesy or say. A lot of times it can also be what they're teaching and demonstrating because in the seductive arena, if it, you know, we are the sum total of our belief systems. Mm -hmm. And that just is what it is. You know, we got saved because we believed somewhere along the way Jesus was the way, the truth, and the life. And then we responded to that belief. So as we're growing in God, our belief systems are constantly coming into a place of inspection and reformation by God, by his word, by Holy Spirit. What false prophets can do is teach false belief systems, which then get you stuck in an area where God can't really move mm -hmm. the way he wants to. So for Jezebel, I think it reinforces the power structure that that spirit will create. And the other spirit that you mentioned is the religious spirit. Mm -hmm. uh, and those are those Jezebel and the religious spirit seem to go hand in hand uh, yeah. in a lot of ways. You know, the religious spirit, whenever I think about it, it is more uh, condemnation as opposed to conviction. Um, and there's not really a, a way that you can ever attain um, and you, you're always striving and striving. Uh, let's, let's dive more into what that is and how to deal with it. I think if there's any negativity to the, um, charismatic fivefold activated continuation branch of the body of Christ, you just kind of have touched on it, which is this sort of thought that, you know, I'm in the constant struggle of becoming and not operating from a place of sonship. And that's what the religious spirit is really, really good at doing. It's really good at bringing shame and condemnation. And I think that as we've learned about 
different functions and different identities, all too often we have sort of identified ourselves through our function. What do I mean? If I see myself as an intercessor, that becomes the pinnacle of who I am. So I don't really know or I'm not aware of sort of my submission to the father of sonship, which my provision comes from, my protection comes from. If I'm going through an illness that I don't know, man, I'm praying for healing, but I'm not really seeing it and I'm struggling here. All of that can get clouded and that religious spirit will sort of stick you with, you are as good as what you do. And I think if you look at the teachings of the apostle Paul, we did a, um, in our church, we did a in-depth for months Bible study, the book of Ephesians. We had to actually kind of just summarize at the end because we were never going to get through it. But over and over, sure. Paul just keeps on continually reinforcing this, this idea of the gospel of grace, that at the end of the day, all we are, all we ever will be in the kingdom of God is hinged upon the grace of God. It's that elementary principle that God so loved the world that he gave Jesus and Jesus died for us. And that's the sum total of our faith. The problem with the religious spirit, as you've said, it gets you stuck in works. Also, to be prophetic in nature, to be spirit led, according to Romans 8, 14, means a continual progression and journey into the heart of God, the truth of God. It means that you may have understood a certain scripture one way five years ago. And as you've pondered it, reflected on it, and Holy Spirit has revealed more to you, your understanding is now expanded or increased or evolved or changed because you're constantly being discipled by Jesus and those he's put in your life. What the religious spirit does is just, no, we're just camped out here. It's this way or no other way. Um, you know, you got to work hard enough. You got to be right with God. And if you're not, then boom, it's over for you. And it really will stifle the move of God. I think anytime mm. you see the prophetic, you see a revival minded people, you see a people that's moving with God, you're going to see attacks from the religious spirit. I like to use the passage in Acts 14, where there's revival in Iconium, the multitude of believers are being added, but it ends up saying the city was divided. And they were divided mm -hmm. because there was a segment of the population that was digging in their heels to say, this is not how we've always done it. And I think mm -hmm. anytime we get there, we are not uh, available for the move of God personally or corporately. Yeah. You know, you, you, you kind of mentioned some of the, there was, there was a split in a region and, uh, you know, you, in this article, you give three tools to overcome regional demons. And those are identification, prayer and corporate governing, as well as teaching and development. Can we talk about those three tools to yeah. overcome those regional demons? Cause the regional demons are different than other types of demons. Yeah. And usually, usually you're going to trace somewhere if you spend enough time working at it, you're going to trace some kind of entry point or validation for that mm -hmm. spirit. I like to say demons are legalists. So if I'm dealing with the demonized individual, if I'm dealing with the region, there, there's somewhere that, that that thing found a foothold. And that's typically going to be the place where the prayer starts. Uh, it, it's really praying and moving the region in the spiritual sense out of agreement. I mm -hmm. understand if you're in a region, I live in the greater Atlanta metro area. So this is a big region. You know, I recognize I alone don't have the authority to move the entire region, but as an intercessor, I can begin to in prayer and gathering those that are in prayer with me, begin to pray over the destiny of the region and mm -hmm. beginning to pray against sort of these strongholds we're seeing and for illumination and revelation about what our opponents actually are in the region. So I think you, you start there. We're talking about governing. I'm specifically saying it's operating in authority. All deliverance is connected to authority. Jesus said, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. So the church, the ecclesia has given uh, a, a, an authority that we actually, we don't approach certain prayer points as, oh Lord, if it be your will, rather we're approaching it with a governmental mentality, a governmental authority. So mm -hmm. when we are uh, going for regional transformation, we're literally approaching it from a standpoint of God has given us that authority. And then um, the training and development piece of it, the teaching part, I think that's so critical because ultimately every demon has a mindset. So we're dealing with the demon of religion. There's a religious mindset. If we're dealing with the demon of idolatry, there's a, an idolatrous mindset. Now, you may not over a period of years, you may not see the entire region as we see in Acts 14. You may not see the entire region shift and go the way of the kingdom, but you definitely can create a pocket within that region or a portion of that region mm. that begins to move in the things of God. I would actually argue even 
a strong fivefold ministry based church or or ministry, a regional base of operations, it should start to rise in a place where the people connected to it start to actually disconnect from the demonic influence of the region and they start connecting more to a kingdom culture. But part of that is going to be teaching because your mindset is often going to be connected to whatever the mindset is of that territory, if you're from the territory. So the teaching comes in to begin to renew the mind. You know, a renewed mind is a victorious mind. And the office of the teacher actually is called to renew the mind of the body of Christ corporately. So I used to think this way, John, I used to think like, man, if we can just have revival, God just moves. That's it. And I'm not diminishing that. You know, certainly, yes, Lord, we want to see that in our day. But oftentimes I think you can have an encounter and experience with God, come out from that, go back to your normal life and get stuck under the mindset you had before the encounter. So the teaching sort of helps occupy it. If you think of military terms, Think of the revival as sort of the missile blast. It, it mm. breaks down some walls. It knocks the enemy's troops back. But to shock them off, that, yeah, yeah, to occupy that Terry, it's going to take a different mindset. Yeah, you know, with with, with the fivefold apostolic gifts, it's easy to kind of understand the you know the other four. But apostolic, uh, the apostolic anointing is often misunderstood, and that term is is often. I think people just kind of like to wear it as a name badge sometimes and they don't actually yeah. know what it means and they don't actually operate in that that office as the way that it's supposed to be. You know, you talk about in this article that apostolic people govern, train, send and activate. What else does an apostle actually do? Well, I think they're ambassadorial. So if you think of an ambassador, an ambassador has the full weight of whatever kingdom they're representing. If, if we have the ambassador of Germany coming to America and are the peers of that ambassador dealing with them, they know that that ambassador is not representing their own interests. I like to say this, if the police officer puts their hands up, that person doesn't physically have the strength to stop your car. But because of the authority you recognize, you realize if I don't obey that hand, I'm going to have the full weight of that, that authority behind that person. So an apostle is an ambassador. They are a kingdom representative. One of the distinctions, and they're, they're wise master builders, Paul said, one of the distinctions between that gift and maybe some other gifts is that there should be a pretty prolific kingdom sending. In other words, they're not somebody that's just going to be like, hey, I did a demographic study and I thought this area was a great area to come start a church in. They're going to be somebody that, like Paul says, hmm. boy, I had an encounter with the Lord and he sent me here. We see Paul having that Macedonian encounter. They're going to have those type of encounters where it is a divine sending. I also really believe that an apostle is somebody that Jesus has personally mandated into that space. They've had some kind of uh, encounter with him. They've seen him. They've seen his presence. Somewhere in that, there's been a supernatural marking that says, no, you're really a sent one into a space and a place. And then there, I also believe they're not necessarily just building something for the sake of I'm trying to get X number of people. They are really transformational mm. agents. Their goal is to see the weight of the kingdom established in whatever sphere they're being sent to. So the way that looks different maybe than an evangelist or a pastor is maybe that evangelist or pastor starts a ministry in a region and they're saying, you know, if we get to uh, 500 people, we really feel like we've hit the mark. If we get to 300, we get to 1,000. But the apostolic leader is not going to base it as much on that. They may have goals like that, but they're going to base it more on transformation. They understand mm -hmm. that's really their mandate. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's They're the link between those two spaces. And so they're going to think very different. I also believe they're a very strategic gift in the body of Christ. And they have the ability, especially in the prophetic, to link up with the prophets and hear what God is saying, but they pivot immediately to strategy. And they're looking for, now we hear what you're saying, Lord, what's the strategy of implementation? You know, I think that's really interesting. As you were describing about how the the prophet and the apostle work so well together. You know, I was just thinking about how those are the ones that have often the most uh, set against them. You know, right. cessationists come right. against those those two uh, quite a bit. And um, you know, if you just have preachers 
uh, you know, uh, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, they're all doing very good things. Um, and actually, uh, being an evangelist for many years myself, it's normally the, piece, the the pastors and the teachers that kind of group up together. The evangelists are kind of by themselves mm-hmm. um, trying to help come alongside, but not everybody wants them, which is a, a weird thing. But the apostle and the, the prophet, if you can separate the fivefold by pulling those two, you have really isolated these little pockets of communities, and then you've allowed the dominion over certain areas to really take control. Having the apostle and the prophet be able to work together to help bring strategy into a region is really providing unity, but also structure so that you can take steps against the path of the the enemy. Um, am I am I right? Does that does that make a, does that make a lot of sense? Yeah, absolutely. And if you peel them out, you know, if you got the evangelist, you're going to often have a passion for souls, signs, wonders. You have the teacher, you may very well have some great uh, teaching. But mind you, oftentimes teachers absent those other two influences, they're only going to be teaching on a certain plane or level. Those other two influences, the apostle probably going to pull them up. And then you have a great pastor, you know, you will build a great gathering center. I think where you'll have a deficit is what you said, a lack of strategy and a lack of emphasis sort of on, hey, we've got to have an agenda of transformation because oftentimes the other three gifts, the teacher would look at that someone in teaching, but the other two may not look at it that same way. So there's definitely a deficit that takes place. Yeah. So Ryan, how can we overcome that deficit in our own lives? I would say as individuals, you know, drink from multiple streams. In other words, depending on your own background, don't just stay, okay, I only am comfortable here. Maybe your background is you, you've gone to a great church most of your adult life. You've had great teaching and preaching, but you're like, man, when it comes to prophetic, I'm just totally in the dark. Then go ahead and start to research that. Go ahead and start to read some blogs, watch some videos. I mean, be wise in that because there's mm-hmm. a lot of foolishness in that going on as well. But go ahead and do that and, and, and try to, as a Christian, balance out your spiritual diet. Because what I find most people do, most people get in their space and stay there. I told you before we started the interview, I got saved and was immediately thrust into uh, the Word of Faith move. And that, because of my background, everything I went through, that was very life-giving to me. However, the one thing was... I was having dreams, visions, encounters with Jesus, but did not know what it was. Mm. And there was not a lot of prophetic teaching in the circle I was in. And that created a deficit of understanding. I had the experiences, but didn't know what to do with them. And when I finally started to get in some prophetic streams, it was like, okay, this is what this is now. And it just took my revelation to another level. So as an individual seeking that out to realize that Jesus Christ divided up his gifts in these five categories, and we really need all five, we need to be a bit prophetic. We need to be a bit evangelistic. We need to be a bit pastoral and have grace with people. We need all of it. We may as believers be more dominant in a certain area. Like even if you're not a pastor, you're not a full-time pastor, you may be a very pastoral believer that your real assignment is love and compassion and tending to the other sheep. That's great. But you do want to have an understanding of the prophetic so that when you hit a wall and you don't know how to get through, you can listen to God and you can get the insight you need. So I think being a little bit more diverse in our spiritual diet, in our curiosity of the body of Christ, that's going to be important. And, and, and lastly, on that subject, as you've alluded to, some of the most brilliant, uh, accomplished Christian media figures are cessationists. They basically believe, look, when the original 12 apostles left, there was no more continuation of these things. And I think you have to decide if you are a spirit-filled Christian and you're a part of that camp of people to really believe that Jesus is still moving in the earth, the Holy Spirit is not done speaking to us and just camp out in that. And I've had friends say, yeah, Ryan, but there's there's so many messes that happen in whatever you fill in the blank and spirit built Christianity. There's so many messes that happen in the prophetic. Or, absolutely. And historically, we've always seen this because it's humanity. Mm-hmm. But I know for me, my life was changed when I got saved and then filled with the Holy Spirit. So I am a spirit-filled Christian. I'm not ashamed of that. Uh, I'm not at war with my brothers and sisters who don't agree with that. But I'm also not going to diminish my faith in the move of the Holy Spirit. Same with the fivefold ministry gifts. And I think 
we need to pray and believe God that God would raise up more sound thinkers in spirit-filled Christianity that can mm-hmm. advocate, that can defend our faith and that can teach and disciple others so that we don't fall by the wayside because I want to see the move of God in our generation. Amen. That is so good. We need to see the move of God in our generation. Yes. It's not It's not a, uh, oh, that would be nice. We need to see a move of God in this generation. And you're, you're so true. We've always seen things messed up. Uh, you know, you go back to the epistles of Paul. Why did he write most of them? Because things were messed up. And, you know, he was bringing order and correction when things were getting out of hand. And um, that doesn't say, well, then then Paul wasn't an apostle. You know, the apostles didn't exist because, you know, he wasn't one of the original 12 right. and all this. I mean, you that doesn't that doesn't fly, you know. <laughs> so but we need to look and say, God, help us to de- rightly divide uh, this situation with the word and we'll be able to, you know, come out, uh, come out a- a- as victors in this situation. You know, as, as we're wrapping up here, you know, our, our charge is for the battle. Uh, you know, our charge for the battle, we need to make make sure that we win this war that God's calling us to over the um, the over the demonic governing, the, the demonic governing spirits. Um, so Ryan, would you just pray for the, everybody that's watching um, that they would be able to be a part of seeing these demonic influences in these regions overturned? Absolutely. Father, I just thank you for everybody that's taking the time to listen and watch this. I pray, Father, for wisdom. I hear the Spirit of God say, I'm giving wisdom and wise strategies. For the Lord says, many of you have been asking me, how do I get through this? Many of you have been saying, Lord, how do I combat this? Lord, what what is the next for me? And the Lord says, I'm causing your ear to be tuned into wisdom in the season. The Lord says, be intentional about cutting off distractions. For I hear the Spirit of God say, this is not the time to be distracted for to be distracted is to be delayed, says the Lord. And the Lord says, I'm causing you to tune in. I'm causing you to be aware. I'm causing you to hear, says the Lord. He that hath an ear, let him hear what I would say unto the church. And so I come against distraction and I come against heaviness. Many of you, you battled and wrestled with heaviness, but the Lord says, uh, take pleasure in my promises over your life. Stir yourself up by reminding yourself of my promises over you, said the Lord. I've not forgotten what I said over you what I've said over your family, what I've said over your territory. And the Lord says, don't question my placement in your life for I positioned you in places of useful service says the Lord. I positioned you in firm places and I decree and declare Isaiah 22 and 23 over you. Uh, or to Isaiah 22, 22 and 23 that the key of David will be placed upon your shoulder through prayer and through worship and that what is uh, unlocked no man shall lock, what is open no man shall shut and that God shall fast in you in a firm place as a peg, that God will drive you into the ground of your assignment and you will be immovable, that you have immovable faith and immovable prayer and immovable tenacity. And I pray right now for refreshing, that God would refresh you and breathe on you, that every area of weariness, every area of fatigue would be ministered to by the Holy Spirit. And lastly, I hear the Lord say over leaders, you are necessary. There are leaders that the enemy is trying to get you to quit and to give up and to just say it's over. And the Lord says, I call you necessary. And this day I'm reminding you of the assignment I placed upon your life. And so, Father, I pray that we would be like Paul, having an all to stand, stand there for, that we would have faith and tenacity for the territories you put us in, the ministries you've connected us to. And we would remember that you said upon the cross, it is finished. And we don't war from defeat, but we war from victory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We don't war from defeat. We war from victory. That is how we need to walk. And that is how we need to have this mentality moving forward. And Ryan, I just want to thank you again for writing this article, Overcoming Demonic Dominions and Territories. You gave us some great strategies in the article in Charisma Magazine Online. Go to mycharisma.com to read that. If you just came across this video naturally, go read that article. And if you if you read that article and that's how you got here, we're so glad that you came here as well. Make sure that you like and subscribe to this uh, YouTube channel so that you don't miss any more great interviews like this. Ryan, it's been a blessing to be able to have you here on Charisma Media's Charisma Magazine, Beyond the Article. Thank you so much. Appreciate you. From 1975, Charisma has been at the forefront of reporting on revival, miracles, and the move of God in our world. 
Charisma Magazine is now going exclusively online to reach beyond the physical barriers of a print issue. Charisma Magazine Online is committed to bringing you the very best spirit-led content to inspire your walk with God in this upside-down world. Go to mycharisma.com for exclusive content today.